lid lifters. Now, I turned my power off a couple of times for a week at a time, and we ran into the same scenario. And, and it's a famous last statement of mine. I know I have it somewhere. Ed has enough crap, he probably knows exactly what I'm talking about. I know I've got it. It's on my property. Now, whether it's in my shop, whether it's in my basement, right? Whether it's upstairs, downstairs, in the garage with the other Dutch ovens, I've got it somewhere. And so when you get a bunch of stuff, it's hard to be extremely organized. And yet, where do we have it? Lid lifters. If you're doing Dutch ovens, whether it's a good pair of gloves, some kind of a lid lifter, just we're, we're trying to look at an A to Z scenario. So not just that I've got it, but how am I going to cook it? How am I going to open it? How am I going to filter water for it? How am I going to do whatever? And those are the things that we're looking at. Um, cooking. I see this a lot, and, and, and you got to understand, I deal with people everywhere from A to Z. I deal from the, the little old lady that comes in, and she just wants an extra week's worth of food at home to the guy that literally has a, a cave dug somewhere um, and, and all kinds of stuff piled up in it to guys that have them stashed out in the woods all over the place. Well, when we're looking at that and we're thinking cooking, I get somebody that comes in and says, okay, Rusty, I want to cook. I want oatmeal. They buy a bag of oatmeal and they think they're done. And I go, okay, let me tell you the way my brain works. First of all, if I'm going to have oatmeal, I want to have raisins in it. If I'm going to have raisins in it, I want some cinnamon in it. I probably am going to throw a little brown sugar in there. So now I've got four components rather than what she's got. Well, now I need a pot to cook it in. I need the water. If I've got the water, I need a water filter to filter the water, and I've got to have a container that's going to hold that filtered water, also a container that holds the dirty water in it. Now, if I've got my pot, I've got my water, I've got my oatmeal, I need to have a stove. If I've got a stove, I need to have fuel for it. If I've got fuel for it, I need to have a match to start the stupid thing, right? Kind of following me? Now, if that oatmeal's in a can, I've got to have the can opener for it. And I don't know about you, but if I'm going to have oatmeal, I want hot chocolate with it. So now I need to have some place, you know, to heat water with, an extra pot, with maybe another stove, so they come off at the same time. I've got to have my hot chocolate. I'm going to do that. I, I want bread. So now I need an oven to bake the bread in. I need the seven components that go in the bread. If I'm going to do that, I want jelly with it. Kind of get the point? A, a to Z. Do we think the whole thing all the way through, or are we looking at one little piece of the puzzle? And, and so when we look at how we're going to cook, I never put all my eggs in one basket. Never. What are the different options that are out there? And if this one fails, how else am I going to meet my needs? So when I turned my power off, I just bought a brand new Rocky Mountain stove. They were new out. This was like 18 years ago. It's got a large oval burner and two other burners to it. Man, just the cat's meow. It's three times what a camp chef was, ran out and grabbed it. It was going to do everything I wanted. Well, turned the power off, got ready to rock and roll. And I hadn't used it yet. It was new sitting in the box, but none of us have ever done that. And it was also at the same time they were changing over the propane tanks to the new safety valves. So it took the new propane tank, and I had nothing but the old ones. So it got boxed back up and never got used. Famous last words, I knew I had an adapter somewhere, right? So then I pulled out a three burner uh, commercial stove that I used to use down in Arizona. Somehow, when the transferring of it up here, I could get it to burn one burner. If I turned on two burners, they both went really dim. If I turned on three burners, it went completely out. So that one got set to the side. So then I pulled out the old Primus, kind of like the old Coleman propane stove. You know, the one that if you got stuck four-wheeling, you threw it under the tires to get traction. You beat off the bear with it. You know, it got thrown over the side of the cliff. That's what it looked like. Fired up did what I wanted to. If I just planned on one, I was going to be in trouble. So when we're looking at our fuel and those type things, A to Z. What do I have? Can I light it? What are the situations I'm going to be able to use that under? What are the situations I'm not going to be able to use it under? We sell a Kelly kettle and a lot of people ask me, can I burn briquettes in there? It does not burn briquettes very well in there. So, no to briquettes. 
awesome for wood, pine cones, chips, those type things. So it's a matter of playing with those things. Newspapers, I'm a huge fan of newspaper particularly. Um, I, I heat my house with wood and so do we have extra newspaper hanging around? Do we have boxes of it, bags of it put up in the event, great fire starter. Plus if you don't have enough toilet paper down the road, yeah, you'll get the point. Tripod, what happens if we're just cooking over an open fire in the backyard? Do we have a tripod that we're going to be able to hang our pots on to be able to do it? If you watch the old movies <coughs> with the fireplace, they all had that arm that swung in and out and they could adjust it up and down. They were typically a tiered shape and they would hang it on that level that needed to be done. What are we going to do? Just fuel for thought. Okay, pet food, medicine, and care items. So I want to talk a little bit about feminine hygiene for a second. I don't know about you guys, but if the woman runs out of what she needs to take care of her, her needs, you know, that new Browning shotgun that you've got may have no value to her other than trading that sucker off to get something. What are you going to do? I can remember about 15 years ago when my daughter just started in that time frame, handed my wife 500 bucks and said, go to the store and you buy everything that you and she needs. Everything. And if there's money left over, buy some more. Well, when those run out, what are the options? Do we know what they used to do? Yeah, who wants to go to that option? They literally used a rag. It was inserted, it was taken out, it was sanitized and re reinserted. Ladies, who wants to go for that ride? Uh-uh. So what's out there? I happen to bring, this is kind of new out on the market, they're sea sponges. They have a little antimicrobial. It is inserted. They use these things over in Europe. Wet, softened, inserted, it absorbs ten times its uh, volume. It's taken out rinsed off, sanitized, placed back in. There's another item called a keeper. It actually looks like a little silicone cup, if you would, with a little tab on the end. It's inserted, it captures the fluid, it's taken out, emptied. That's just something to think about. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna meet those needs? Now, there's five main items that are used out of a first aid kit. No particular order, but typically somebody's going to cut themselves and somebody's going to burn themselves. They're not treated with the same components, but how am I going to clean the wound? What ointment or materials am I going to put on the wound? And then bandaging materials to go over it. So it might be that little teeny tiny round band-aid all the way up to gauze and tape and the whole ball of wax. So cover the gamut, but how am I going to clean it? How am I going to put an ointment on it? And then how am I going to protect that? The other, other items are something for an upset stomach, something for a headache. Those are the five most common items used out of a first aid kit. Now, does that mean we don't want to worry about the other stuff? Absolutely not. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, am, I like this statement. Somebody pinned this to me and I said, yes. They said, Rusty, you're fiercely independent, aren't you? And I said, yeah. I don't rely on anybody. I don't want to rely on anybody. So if I've got the resources, I may not know how to use it, but who in here knows how to suture somebody up? So if I've got the suture and it needs to be done, you guys can rock and roll and take care of that, right? We have our own sutures. Yeah. Fish line. That thick. Right? Make sure it holds. It's for you. Duct tape. <laughs> so what, what are we going to do? I mean, do you kind of see what I'm looking at? If we're not going to rely on somebody else, don't know if the resources are even going to be there, how are you going to meet those needs? And so I think it's important that we go down and look through those. We'll talk about manuals and those things in a little bit. But how are you guys going to cut your hair? What hair? <laughs> if you had hair, how are you going to cut it? How, how are you going to make Do you have scissors at home to do it? I mean, it sounds really dumb, break out the old garden shears or, you, you know, it's just some of those little standard care items. Those that like to shave, do you have a bunch of razors? What are the options that are out there? Like to. Mama's going to make you, right? Um, gunshots. How are you going to treat gunshots? Major blood stoppers. 
you know what, what what's out there Kotex work awesome for that great great absorbent <coughs> slap it on a little duct tape you know until you can meet the needs of it I've talked to a number of backcountry um, uh, rescue workers and they said yeah some people would probably be surprised at some of the items that we carry in our kits that we know work better than the things we're required to carry uh, to meet those needs desserts and comfort foods so I read the journal right after I moved up here so it was about 20 years ago there was an ice storm that hit up around um, Montreal um, I had lived south of Montreal in Burlington Vermont and uh, it took the power out and some of these people were without power for four four and a half months and we go into some of the different things that happened there were two semi trucks of generators that people had paid for that showed up into this one small town and the uh, local city government took them all said that they need them distributed where they felt that they were most appropriated um, what are we going to do with those type things but this one lady she had a well on her property it was a hundred yards down a hill six inches of ice she said that it was too hard to go down to the well and back. They had actually tried chipping it out. They had thrown ashes on it. It was easier to go chip the ice, melt it on the stove, and then purify it than it was to get down to her well. So those were just the type of things that she went through. At the very end of her journal, what was really interesting, she said, if I only had more nuts and more chocolate, it would have been easier. Of all the things she could have had, more nuts and more chocolate, so what are those vices? What are those things? I've got a friend that's a, a Coca-Cola holic. I mean, he's like Rusty. Come on, man, figure out how to dehydrate that stuff. We'll make a <laughs> mint. And and so there's two things: dehydrated pizza or freeze-dried pizza, and Coke or Pepsi, and and we're all set, right? Life's good again. But what are those comfort items? Do you have some of those things put up? Some of those niceties that you can come home and look forward to. Any questions on anything? Okay, there's a bunch of stuff, so I'm just going to run, and, and you guys tell me when to shut up. Um, water filters and water storage. When I go out and talk to a group of uh, people, I might have 40 or 50 people in the room. I will ask them, who doesn't have enough food for a month? We're not talking well-rounded meals, but who wouldn't die in a month? They could eat something and, and make it through. I might get 10%, 0 to 10% will raise their hand and say they don't. So I'll turn around and say it takes a gallon of water per person per day, times the number in your family. Who doesn't have a two-week supply of water for their family? And I get upwards of 70 to 80% of the people that raise their hands. So people have covered the food for a month, but not the water. So the water is, is something that's a real key. Now we can't particularly store all the water that we're going to drink, so then do we have the water filters? We have the ability to take the water that's around us. We've got a lot of water around us. It's just a matter of making that drinkable. Um, we just got hooked up with a, a guy again that makes a, it's called the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Drop it down in the well and pull it up for those that don't have the means, generators and those type things. We've got water around us. It's just a matter of getting it, you know, so, so we've got that we can use it. Ice chest. Why would we use an ice chest in the wintertime? Keep the critters from eating your product. We keep the outside. critters from out of it because that's where we're going to put it to keep it cold. Right. What else? No, so you just keep things warm. Stop things from freezing, absolutely, and to keep things warm. Um, basically, it's, it's a, a ready made wonder box, too. If you need to keep things warm longer, drop whatever you've got down inside of that, and it will help hold that heat in. Where would we use the ice chest in the uh, summertime? Okay, so we're going to keep things out of our stuff. How about if that got buried in the ground and then our product got put down inside of that? It's going to keep things much, much cooler. How many of you guys know what the, the original refrigerators look like? What, what did they look like before ice boxes? Do you know what they were like? Before ice boxes, it was nothing more than a box that had screen on it had a water reservoir on top it had canvas that ran down the four sides of it it would absorb that water run down as a breeze hit it it kept whatever inside was cooler 
didn't necessarily keep it cold, but kept it cooler. That was the old original way to refrigerate, if you would, until ice boxes came out and, and then so on and so forth. So we can use a very similar principle depending on what we've got. But how are we going to keep product in its longevity it is something that's important to look at. Um, salt. I started looking this up yesterday. Over 14,000 registered uses for salt. Salt traded pound for pound with gold through the Depression. In 1961 in New Orleans, a bag of salt sold for 50 cents. In, in 1861. In 1865, it sold for $20. During the war, they took out a lot of the salt plants, and the value just skyrocketed. Dirt cheap today. What are some of the uses you guys are going to use salt for that just come off quick off your, your mind? What would you use it for? <laughs> Preserving, <laughs> curing meat. Flavoring. Flavoring. What else? Sterilizing. Sterilizing things. How about homemade uh, electrolytes? I mean, there's a ton of uses for it. Like I say, it's dirt cheap to put it up. How else are you going to preserve meat? You know, how else are you going to, what, what are your plans on doing with some of those things? Um, if you got another plan, you plan on drying it, you got a smoker, those type things, rock and roll. But it's just another option out there, and it's something that's real cheap to put up to. <coughs> um, garden seeds. $100 worth of garden seeds equals somewhere between $1,000 and $1,700 worth of produce. How many of you guys have garden seeds put up? For multiple years. If we look back in the 1800s, this was a pretty typical three-year cycle that they dealt with in homesteading. One year of plenty, produced more than they needed, excess crop. One year that was just enough to meet their needs, and one year that was a total flop. So I don't know about you, but for me, I want to have a four or five year supply of seeds because I know where my luck would fit into there. It would be one year of nothing, two years of nothing, three years okay, um, Am I able to regroup those seeds and capture those seeds and use them from one year to the other? Are we playing with that now? How many of you guys have some seeds you took out of your garden this year that you're drying to see what they'll do next year, to see if you're able to recapture them? It's a great thing to do. We need to practice that now and play with that now. Um, it definitely is a necessity. Sprouting. If we don't sprout, I will tell you that your food storage is dramatically lacking. I did write a food storage cookbook. It's using nothing but freeze-dried or dehydrated products in there. Um, there's some nutritional value from that. Our nutritional value will come from the fresh produce that we eat and from the sprouts. Um, we can have sprouts year-round. They're cheap, they're easy, they're simple, and they are absolutely loaded with nutritional value. So it's something to, to really look at and pay attention to. On an average, and I'm seeing a little variance in there, I'll just give you a quick little glimpse into sprouts. They're saying that they need to be aerated every one to three years. In other words, you need to open up your sprouting seeds, dump them back and forth in a, in a container, put some new fresh oxygen around there, somewhere between one and three years, and they're willing to go and say that you've got somewhere between a 10-year to a 15-year shelf life on those. Does that mean a 20-year-old seed won't sprout? No, they're sprouting wheat out of the pyramids, 2,000 plus years old. It just means that the quantity that will sprout starts to dramatically uh, decrease. The other thing is, is I'm seeing anywhere from a recommendation of 75 pounds of seeds per person to about 125 pounds of seeds per person that are being suggested to store. On an average, they're saying anywhere from half a cup to a cup and a half of sprouts per person per day. Some are willing to say once a day, others are suggesting at every meal. Um, so that you're getting that in, your body has a chance to absorb that, do its thing, and, and break it down before it passes it on. So strictly up to you guys. Toilet paper, how much is enough? I never have enough. <laughs> never have enough particularly if you have women and girls in the house, right? Um, there again, it's one of those things. It takes up a bunch of room. 
It's something that you got to look at, worth its weight in gold. So I decided to do a little research for you guys tonight. Three main recommendations if you run out of toilet paper. Cloth that you're going to treat just like a diaper. You're going to wipe yourself. It's going to go into a separate container. It's going to get washed, sanitized, reused. Soft leaves. Might be hard to come by right now. Number three, hadn't thought about it. Um, I thought about number four, which was snow. Um, for those that have had that opportunity, it was a refreshing experience. Number three, smooth rock. Dirt clubs. Yeah, not interested. <laughs> so the options are <laughs> toilet paper, save your old uh, phone books, um, newspapers, whatever you've got, but it's something to look at and it's something to consider. Spices. Why did we start exploring the world? What was the main driving focus back then? Spices. Spices. They were worth their weight more than gold. They would lug spices back and leave the gold sitting on the beaches. Um, how do we take the same things and make them taste different? And, and that's what we're going to find out with spices. So here's just a quick example. When people say, what kind of spices do I need? Go to the grocery store, go to the soup aisle, take a sheet of paper and a pen. It's better if you have two people. One person pull up every box of a soup or a stew. Okay, this is the type minestrone. This are the spices that they're using in it. Then you grab another company's minestrone. This is the spices they put in theirs. And you grab another one if there's another one. Over a period of time, my wife and I came up with 27 different flavors of soups or stews, which is what I counsel to be used for our food storage, soups or stews. One pot meal, something where you throw a wide variety of items into it, let it sit on the stove, do its thing, flavor it, and eat it. So how are you going to take the same basic components and make it taste different? Who's ever had a super stew that was lemon pepper flavored? I put up a bunch of lemon pepper just to simply do that. There's no fish in it, but I like the flavor of lemon pepper, and it's going to just give me another option to make the same things taste different. No secret on storing. I vacuum pack my spices. I buy them, um, and I put them in a vacuum bag, and I vacuum pack them. I try to break them down in smaller quantities, some with the idea that I could barter or trade some off, others that I'm just not opening up a bigger package of them. When you do spices, get to the whole item if you can. Buy whole nutmeg, whole allspice, buy cinnamon sticks. If you've ever noticed you buy ground cinnamon, you use it or you take a cinnamon stick and you grate it and all of a sudden it's like, wow, that really smells good. Why is that? Inside is where the oils and the aromas are. That oil carries the flavor and the aroma. Have you ever noticed on any of the cooking shows, if the guy's putting leafy spices in, he's always doing this to it. He's trying to break up that outside shell that has dried and open up the oils inside of it. Same thing with our spices. If you take a mortar and pencil, you all know what that is? Little cup, pound it, break it open, stir it up. You'll open some of that up and you'll, you'll pick up a lot more of the flavoring um, that was designed out of there and the aroma from that. Dutch ovens. Dutch ovens are nothing more than what are the sturdy pots that we can have. And to me, there's really only three on the market. Dutch ovens, stainless steel, and enamel. Um, those really are the only things that I can take and I can use um, on an open fire. I can use them over and over and over again. If the pot boil, you know, runs dry and boils dry, it's not going to ruin any of those. If I'm using aluminum or some of the other metals that are out there, there can be some, some concerns with that, that. So I want something that I can get and use longevity-wise. So what about the anodized aluminum? You know, there again, um, that, that's just got a coating on that. Um, I have not done enough research into that to see if those can overheat and if it's going to affect it, where that anodized will start to break down or not. Um, I can tell you that in the cold, they have had cracking out of those, but no different than a Dutch oven. You take a hot Dutch oven and throw it in a snowbank, you've got a 50-50 chance whether you're going to have a Dutch oven left or not. Um, so those would be the only concern. Um, so I, I couldn't give you an answer there. 
I, they sure are nice if you're packing them. So, stainless steel. This is my favorite bowl plate combination. Um, durable. Yeah, he wants to take 20 of them to play frisbee with somebody. Um, last forever, right? Simple, easy, off and running. So when I look at things preparedness-wise, I'm looking for things that are going to have that longevity with them. Um, let's see, cooking ovens, pots, solar ovens. I get that all the time. Rusty, what would you do? This is how I would go about it. First thing I would get would be a little butane stove. When I say butane stove, something that you're going to see like at an omelet bar or where they're, where they're doing um, crepes and stuff. Just a little portable, lock it in, snap it on, safe to use indoors. It powers out for a day or five days or whatever. Mama can pull it in. You don't have to break a bunch of stuff out. The second thing that I then would have, um, now I'm talking more long-term wise, is a Kelly kettle. With our food storage, it's typically freeze-dried or dehydrated. It needs hot water to reconstitute it. So I would have a Kelly kettle and a thermal cooker. I should have brought a thermal cooker. Does anybody not know what a thermal cooker is? It's a giant thermos. Big pot. They use them in the Orient. They don't use slow cookers in the Orient. They use thermal cookers. They don't use crock pots in the Orient. They use thermal cookers. Flip it open, two pots inside. Basically, you're putting hot water in there, boiling water. That thermal properties from that boiling water will cook whatever you put into it. So uh, a potato is about six hours. Put boiling water in there with a whole potato, six hours it's cooked. Meats, four to six hours depending on the cut that you're using. Um, I boiled water in my kitchen, 177 degrees. Six hours later, it was still 155 degrees. So there's wonder boxes. You can use ice chests, those other type things. This is actually what has been made to meet that needs um, over in the Orient, and they're wonderful. It's just called a thermal cooker. Um, we carry a Saratoga Jack. We used to be able to get in a, a Thermos Nissan combined one that, that developed them. Um, they pulled those out of the United States. They're not available here. But the Saratoga Jack is a uh, great item to have. Anybody not know what a Kelly kettle is? So a Kelly kettle is just a pot. It's a hot water pot. So if you can envision basically a top pot, the whole center of it is wide open all the way up to the top, and it has a very thin wall that the water sits in. So you put 54 ounces of water in it, you start a fire in a small container below it, set it on there, all that fire and heat rises up the center, it brings it to a boil. It's the most efficient water pot I've seen on the market. Uh, four inches of a two by four will bring that 54 ounces of water to a boil in nine minutes. Simple, easy, there's pot supports you can put on the top. If you're not heating water, there's another hobo stove you can put on there. Um, but there again, with my food storage, I just need hot water. So I've got the thermal cooker to actually cook it in and the Kelly kettle to bring the water to a boil. <coughs> Those kind of are going to be my first main focus. I have propane, but I'm not going to run out and use my propane unless I really need to. Um, so I've got three or four good propane stoves. I've got briquettes. I've got three, four hundred pounds of briquettes stored. I'll use those right time, right place. I have solar ovens that I'll use to primarily do my baking with. Um, so I look out there and I've got a handful of other things from rocket stoves uh, across to a number of little guys. Just depends on the situation I'm in and what I'm going to do. Matches. Got to keep them dry. Matches don't typically deteriorate unless there's moisture involved. So whenever you buy matches, I typically buy the uh, Strike Anywhere matches. I drop them in a quart baggie, ziplock them, put them in a six gallon bucket, fill it up with matches, drop in a couple of oxygen absorbers, seal that up. I know that then I've got a bucket of matches that I can go to. Now, those that have kids in Scouts, you have to be a little bit careful. So I had a Scout Master come up to me and said, dang, Rusty, how many matches do you have at home? And I said, well, I've got quite a few matches. No, you don't. I go, no, no, really, I've got cases and cases of matches at home. No, you don't. I go, okay, why don't I have a bunch of matches at home? 
because every camp out your son comes on, he brings 12 to 15 boxes of matches. And I go, don't tell me. He plays what we call football with them, right? He goes, I don't know what's football. You take the match box, you turn it on the side with the striker, you hold the match up, and when it's dark, psh, it lights and it flips through the air. He says, oh, heck no. He dumps them in a big pile and says, I'll start the fire. Woof. Ah. Yeah, there went a couple hundred dollars worth of matches that I had no idea were slowly disappearing. There's a lock on that door now. <laughs> um, what are you going to do? If we get back to that point, we are starting a lot of fires. What are the things? Butane lighters. I want to show you guys this. I don't know how many of you guys have ever seen a forever match. This is a forever match. We used to bring these in from BCB when I first opened 20 years ago. We sold these guys from anywhere from $15 to $25. It's simply nothing more than a container that has some lighter fluid down inside with a built-in striker on it. So on the end of this is fiberglass. Every time I dip it in, it gets more fuel on it and then lights. Forever match. Use it over and over and over. Just refill it over and over and over. These are sold by a company out of um, Canada and they sell it strictly as a striker. They've got these little uh, fuel tabs with it. The idea is, is you take this, you fray it out. Anybody know Alan Purdy from ISU? Alan Purdy taught the winter and survival <coughs> class down there for dozens of years. He's traveled all over the world, all kinds of survival situations. Most sensitive tinder on the market. They've had uh, competitions. A dead bit uh, lighter, just that little spark will actually ignite this. They've not gotten that to ignite anything else. So they say, fray that out, strike it down. I open one up one, that's a forever match. We couldn't get them out of Britain anymore. Um, they sell for nine bucks as a, as a little kid awesome item to have, um, particularly for lighting things. They're again reusable over and over and over again.